We will have panels coming up in April focused on rising stars in this area of uh, computing for public health and conservation. We will, we will hold workshops this summer. We continue to hold workshops in these areas of AI for social impact, AI for public health and conservation. We also collaborate with other organizations, uh, particularly in the local areas, non-governmental non organizations focused on social impact and with other organizations that students have, uh, Tech for Good, undergraduate student organization, Tri.ai and others. So we welcome your participation, not only in the seminar series, but all these other events, uh, which we will keep uh, updating on our website and through our social media channels. So with this, uh, I'm going to hand this over to Harman uh, Saxono, uh, and Arpita Viswas, who are the co-organizers of this seminar series, to introduce our speaker for today. Thank you. Thank you, William. It's an honor for me to introduce Dr. Lauren Wilcox, and um, I'm asking everyone at the end of this introduction, if you are able, please uh, show your applause on screen, or if you want, you can also share the applause reaction on Zoom. So Lauren is the research lead in the Google Wellbeing Lab, she brings over 13 years of experience conducting human-centered computing research in service of human health and well-being. Previously at Google Health, she, uh, in, she led initiatives to align AI advancement in healthcare with the needs of clinicians, patients, and their family members. Lauren also holds an associate professor position in Georgia Tech School of Interactive Computing. She received a career award from the NSF and a dissertation award from the Agency of, for Healthcare Research and Quality. She also authored several recognized papers uh, and um, some of them receive editor choice as well as best papers and best paper honorable mentions. Last year, Lauren was named as a senior member of the ACM in 2020, and she was also the, an inaugural member of the ACM Future of Computing Academy. Lauren frequently served on the organizing and technical program committees for premier conferences in the field of um, HCI, such as ACM CHI. She also received her PhD in computer science from Columbia University in 2013. And with that, I invite everyone to do welcome Dr. Lauren Wilcox to present her talk, Participatory Approaches to AI in Digital Health and Well-Being. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for that warm intro. I really appreciate it. <laughs> um, so I want to provide some background motivating the rest of the talk. Um, in the past 10 to 15 years, we've seen really a confluence of advancements in computing infrastructure, in mobile and wearable devices, um, in policy, and in the collection and sharing of rich data sets. And these have attracted computing researchers to areas of digital health and healthcare. So it's no wonder why uh, we're seeing AI being applied to meet challenges in healthcare. Um, and we see several examples like deep neural network-based machine learning approaches to classification and detection of several types of cancer, um, as well as diabetic retinopathy screening, which I'll actually talk more about in a minute. But while we see a lot of potential for AI to be helpful, we also see challenges going from research and development env environments to um, real world environments. This last mile ends up being really hard. For example, um, in the worst case, uh, AI enabled systems don't improve clinical accuracy. So radiologists in multiple studies rarely change their diagnostic decisions after the addition of computer aided diagnosis. And, you know, unfortunately, it had no statistically significant effect on radiologist performance. So, you know, there are other issues too, some of them listed here. So, you know, what's going on? Um, well, in a health context, we have to look not just at the performance of one technology, you know, or one model. We have to think about the socio-technical system as a whole. And what do, I, what do I mean by this? Well, socio-technical system um, won't be new to many of you on the call, but in case this is you know, sort of a, a new way of seeing systems, to consider a system to be socio-technical is to acknowledge that the way it functions as a whole emerges from the interplay of its envisioned design 
and purpose and its actual use. You know, what happens as it's integrated into ecosystems of other technologies, workflows, social processes. We know that technologies can disrupt social norms, expectations, um, and contexts of care. And in turn, you know, these norms and care contexts impact use of technology and, and even willingness uh, to use something new. So I wanna walk through <clears throat> a case uh, from research at Google that highlights how important these socio-technical systems are. So our extended team at Google developed a machine learning based model to detect diabetic retinopathy and macular edema on standard fundus photographs. So these are photos of the retina, which is that thin layer at the back of the eye that senses light and sends signals to the brain. And the model makes an assessment of whether or not a patient is going to need to be referred to a specialist for treatment. And two retrospective evaluations showed that the model performed very well, essentially on par with a retinal specialist. Well, the Thailand Ministry of Health partnered with us to address the shortage of specialists in Thailand and improve eye screening throughput. So we deployed our deep learning system in a prospective study to evaluate system accuracy in the field and hopefully improve eye screening processes along the way. So what you see here is an image of the user interface of the screening system. <clears throat> so this, this patient that, uh, who's, um, who was photographed has been flagged for referral to an ophthalmologist shown in pink above the image of the retina here. So alongside the prospective study evaluating system accuracy, we conducted a human-centered study that involved field research at 11 clinics across Thailand over a period of eight months. And we wanted to study workflow both before and after deployment of this deep learning system. So our data included interviews, observations, as well as analyses of logs and usage data of the system. And um, my, you know, I had the privilege of being one of the mentors of this work, but I definitely wanna call out uh, Emma Beattie and Elizabeth Taylor, the first and second authors on, on the paper uh, that you see cited down here. They did you know, just so much work in on the ground research and data collection here. Um, so moving over to these images, in the images we see on the bottom, we see a nurse interacting with our system here. Um, we see a nurse interacting with study paperwork. And on the top right, we've got an image of a busy waiting room. So let's zoom in on this. Um, so you know, we observed some differences across clinics, but in general, there was a consistent workflow uh, the patient arrives in the morning and sits with about 100 or so other patients who queue up to receive a full diabetic checkup. So they're getting their blood sugar checked, their feet, their eyes, their teeth, and they sit with a number and they wait to be seen uh, because there are no appointments, right? And so we can already see differences from what most of, exper of us experience here in the U.S. The whole experience can take up to five hours for the patient, and the eye screening portion is only allotted about 90 seconds. And in that time, the nurse has to capture images, do a quick assessment, and decide if the image needs to be sent to an ophthalmologist for review. And anything that trips this up could cause delays and, and long waits. So before we deployed our system, we asked nurses you know, what their expectations were. And you know, nurses saw the potential for AI to help them up-level their skills, for example, helping them distinguish levels of severity of diabetic retinopathy, and we found that pretty interesting because in prior work, we found that clinicians have different mental models of what this type of AI technology um, provides and how they wanna work with that, right? Some see it as more of, a, of an assistant that they train. Some see it as more of a, a system that could train them. And it's really important to capture these uh, because they, these differences have uh, implications for how we approach explainability and what strategies we use. So let's look at the second point. Interestingly, nurses also mentioned that an AI system could confirm what they already knew. So we heard things like, they don't believe us and it could confirm what we already know. So nurses were expressing frustration that their assessments were undervalued or sometimes dismissed um, by some physicians. And they were excited about the potential to demonstrate their own expertise. So this illustrates a social goal, right, of these systems, not just technical. In this case, balancing asymmetries in perceptions of expertise. At the same time, you know, 
touching on this third point here, they were concerned about the time it might take to upload uh, some of the photos due to internet issues at, at the sites that they're working in. And mentioned concerns about how a new system with specific requirements might cause some of these patient delays um, that, that were common because of the short time that they had. So what happened when we introduced our deep learning system into the retinal screening process? Well, one of the first things we learned had to do with something called gradability. So gradability refers to the ability to read an image and make an assessment. And when clinicians are conducting screenings, you know, they have, they have guidelines that they use to determine if the retina is clear enough for them to make an assessment about whether or not the patient might have diabetic retinopathy. <clears throat> and you know, these guidelines and in their interpretation can vary between clinicians. And our deep learning model needed to set a threshold for features around image quality, like blur and darkness, before it could make an assessment. And if the image is extremely blurry, you know, just like the clinician, the model might deem it ungradable. And after the deployment of the deep learning system, we observed from system logs that on average, about 20% of the images couldn't be read by the model. They were, they were ungradable. So, you know, field work was really important for capturing, you know, why this might be happening. So we observed that there, you know, are different conditions in the environment of use than the conditions in the development environment. And, you know, this, this seems like, well, of course, right? <laughs> of course that, that could be the case. Um, but, you know, the important thing I think to note here <clears throat> is uh, that these differences really do affect things like gradability. And so we really need to better understand them um, and plan ahead, you know, upstream. So, you know, we witnessed, for example, imperfect lighting conditions because of the volume, um, you know, demonstrated in the photos I showed earlier, there was little time to let pupils adjust for each photo. And so we started to see workarounds for these, as we can see in the image here on the right, with nurses providing a blanket or a towel to help pupils adjust more quickly. We also observed that the study protocol made the workflow burdensome for some patients who were referred to specialists. And so we were, we were very focused on model development um, <clears throat> uh, in the lab, but we learned that researching how protocols might best fit the workflow was really important to do early on. And so the design of study protocols for conducting these kinds of human-centered perspective studies of AI are really important uh, and they're an open area that I think we need a lot more um, research and, and best practices in. Uh, same is true with studies on end-to-end -end service design of AI-based clinical applications. This is an open and, and very ripe area. Well, together, some of the shortcomings we saw affected trust in the system and willingness to use the deployed system. And so, you know, the image quality threshold for gradability, it turns out that that didn't match nurses' previous practices. And so even though our model was really accurate, nurses perceive the system as less accurate than a human expert. We heard things like some images are blurry and I can still read it, but the, image, the system can't. Or I think it's not as accurate. If the eye is a little obscured, it can't grade it. And so, again, this kind of reminds us that um, you know, we, we need to better consider current practices and environment to, to uh, anticipate, you know, what kinds of factors will weigh in to people's um, attitudes toward the, the technology and perceptions, right, of how well it works. So in summary, you know, I think this is a really interesting case study of how, you know, model accuracy alone is not enough. We went in confident, but found that there were issues that impacted trust and had some downstream effects for patients. Um, of course, you know that that doesn't mean that uh, that we didn't have you know many positive outcomes as well. Um, but you know this was a learning exercise, and I think you know moving forward, we you know better understand uh, that much of the success of the system adoption, ability to drive outcomes continues to also be influenced by protocols around use, um, as we saw in our prospective study, uh, as well as you know, a, a highly accurate model. And finally, we see the study as an important example of how human-centered design fits into an AI development process. Um, we, can kind of, we can see why it would be important to conduct human-centered evaluations before 
uh, as well as during and after deployment of the system to inform further development, right? And also gain a, a really needed understanding of where potential obstacles are, opportunities for workflow integration, right? And what user trust really looks like in these settings. Of course, all of this, you know, in turn pos can positively impact patient care, right? And that's the outcome that we're looking for. So, you know, we published findings from that study in April of last year, and we were encouraged to see that in the fall, Nature Medicine, the British Medical Journal, and the Lancet all announced new standards for how clinical trials should be conducted and reported. So the SPIRIT AI statement is one set, and it specifies that AI researchers will now have to describe things like the setting in which the AI is evaluated and details about how humans interact with the AI. The other set of guidelines comes from CONSORT. So CONSORT provides minimum guidelines for reporting randomized trials. And their new reporting guidelines for clinical trials that have an AI component include the need to report on settings in which AI will be integrated. Um, and again, the human AI interaction. So this is a big deal uh, because these statements set the standard for clinical trials used around the world for drug development, um, uh, as well as, as di diagnostic screening and testing and other medical interventions. But published studies um, aren't on the human AI interaction, right? And, and kind of the environments of use versus the environments of development. Published studies on these are not exactly common practice. And so ours is the only study people cite when talking about how to achieve these new guidelines. And so essentially we need more studies. Uh, this is an area where we need a lot more work. Notice also that the study I just walked through really looked at the later stages of system development, right? Mostly deployment of the system here. And one of the reasons that the study got attention is because, you know, I would argue uh, often human computer interaction or, or human um, centered computing expertise is called in, you know, later, uh, at, at later stages of development. And one way to get ahead of problems is to conduct research that incorporates human and socio-technical perspectives throughout each stage of creating machine learning or AI-based systems. So I've abstracted the stages here. This is, you know, this is very heavily abstracted. It, see it as an organizational tool. Um, uh, and I'll refer to this as a pipeline, um, you know, during the course of the rest of the talk. And I'll talk about some studies that use human-centered design and research at different stages of this pipeline to illustrate how we've tried to take participatory approaches. So I already talked about some of my research at Google. So the next couple projects will focus on work uh, from my team at Georgia Tech. And you'll see the use of human-centered research like ethnographic observation, but also the use of participatory design methods. Um, and where possible, we, we draw from the tenets of community-based participatory research. So first, let me clarify you know, what I mean by this. So I say inspired by community-based participatory research or CBPR, because there are similarities between participatory design and CBPR, but there are also differences. So CBPR shares a common goal with participatory design to incorporate perspectives of the intended users, the, the stakeholders uh, of a technology in the design of that technology. And each has roots in action research. So this is collecting data and reflecting on the situation or a problem space and then acting. A big part of action research is not, that, not just the reflection piece um, and the analysis of data about a problem space, but then the acting on the evidence. Um, and that action becomes part of the research. Um, and so there's, you know, they, both of these approaches have roots in action research, but the type of engagement between researchers and community participants is where the two start to diverge. So looking on the right here at CBPR, notice there's an emphasis on equitable partnerships. So this means community co-ownership and control of projects as equal partners and mutual benefit really for both partners. Um, the community is also seen as the authority on their community and many CBPR engagements aim to give agency to the community to set and change goals even uh, for the research project. And equity is also seen 
uh, in terms of uh, credit for research and how it's positioned to make impact. So Chris Ladontek, I think, will be speaking at an upcoming talk in the series. And, and he and Sarah Fox have a great um, CSCW, ACM CSCW paper from 2015 encouraging practitioners of community-based approaches to situate their contributions in terms of the local community, instead of thinking primarily about just the research community. Um, and finally, you know, engagement in CBPR happens across all project phases. So, you know, this affects, for example, data collection. Data collection is framed as an intervention for social action by participants, whereas in participatory design, data collection is seen as, as really more to enable the development of a design intervention or solution. So there's kind of a predetermined objective with participatory design. So anyway, it will be exciting to see more adoption of community oriented approaches in machine learning research because we're starting, the community is starting to see this as an important approach to fairness. Um, so next I'll walk through how we use participatory methods that were inspired by these two approaches. Um, primarily participatory design. So through a five-year partnership with Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, my lab conducted studies spanning multiple clinics, and we were motivated to partner together around patient engagement goals. Specifically, um, we noticed that the prevalence of chronic conditions among adolescents is growing. And in some cases like cancer and blood disorders, outcomes can be actually worse for teenage adolescents than for um, patients with the same, other patients with the same conditions. And engagement and communication tend to be really difficult with this age group. So CHOA, Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, was interested in how computing technology could be designed to better reach this group. So we had the privilege of working with almost 120 patient and family participants in our studies and 34 clinical caregivers. Um, I wanna call out Matt Hogg here. He conducted his PhD research throughout this partnership. Um, he graduated last year and now he's at University of Washington School of Medicine, but you'll notice that he's first author on many of these papers. So to begin, we dove into field work, really looking at how patients, family members, and clinicians were working together to manage the patient's health. And we conducted 38 interviews and observed 14 oncology encounters, all in situ. So we were focused primarily on the clinical setting, but we asked families questions about managing conditions you know, day to day. And here we wanted our field work to inform the earlier phases of the pipeline that I showed earlier, um, essentially starting with problem selection. How do we collaboratively arrive at problems um, that are you know, relevant and important for the team? Then what other data sets do we need to collect? What outcomes are we looking for as a team? And we did this with parents, teens, and clinical caregivers. Essentially, we didn't want to go in with too many assumptions about what to build. We collected rich qualitative data. Here we took an inductive approach to qualitative data analysis, which means that we went bottom up from raw transcribed segments of interviews and observation notes to progressively higher level units of meeting in a, in a reflexive thematic analysis process. Uh, in vivo here, you see in vivo coding. That means that uh, the emphasis is on the actual spoken words of participants and we try to em embody their point of view in vivo and em embodying uh, their lived experience. And to complement our qualitative analysis, we conducted a mixed method study to investigate families' experiences accessing the technology they already had available. Um, we wanted to understand what are they doing now and could this, could this actually be an avenue for patient engagement? So we looked at personal health record use. Um, these online personal health records are often called portals um, and they include health record data like diagnostic test results, but also electronic messaging, appointment scheduling, visit reviews. So we enrolled families on a rolling basis to um, those families who, who would consent to our observations of their use of the system, not you know, data, not specific results of data, but metadata, right, about in their engagements and their data accesses. So we enrolled families on a rolling basis, registering them with the portal and then conducting surveys and interviews after the observation period. And fortunately, most families reg that we enrolled regularly accessed my chart over the observation period. 
from log data, looking across participants, we found that diagnostic test results were the most frequently accessed feature. This is just descriptive statistics, followed by you know, messaging and lab test order reviews. You know, so it turns out that lab results, um, lab orders, and communication um, were you know, really the top three here. And we found that teens, when we look, in, when we look at survey data, we found that teens got a bit more out of having an online personal health record. They were more likely to indicate that the information helped them to ask questions they wouldn't have known to ask. And that after accessing the system, they knew more about their health, had an easier time keeping track of information in the system than their parents did. Uh, so there's a lot more in, in the paper referenced down here, but basically we started to see that families and teen patients appreciated the health IT that was available and they wanted to be a user of these health IT systems. Taken together, we saw some key themes emerge from these studies and I'll, I'll focus on the first one and also touch on the fourth one in a bit. So both teens and parents had unmet information access and communication needs and they often mention diagnostic data, which isn't, isn't surprising um, given what we observe in the logs. Teens in particular wanted access to this and some mentioned that their doctors perceive them as being unable to understand detailed explanations. They wanted a lot more details than what they were getting. So teen five in our study said, sometimes I tell my mom questions to ask them so that I don't have to ask them. They don't want to explain everything to me because they think I won't get it. So interestingly, they often mentioned diagnostic radiology data. Um, team 10 said, the scans make me feel a little bit like I'm in there. I can see what's wrong with me, so they don't have to tell me in some weird way. And so, you know, we also heard this echoed you know, throughout many of the teens and parents that we studied. And our field work revealed that these patients spend a lot of time getting CT and MRI scans, you know, three or four per year. And this requires lots of preparation waiting, getting scanned, and then really not much reporting at the end. So the oncologist weighs in briefly, the patient is entitled to a DVD if, if, you know, if, if they choose to uh, seek that out. But radiology data are complex, right? So these are comprised of thousands of cross-sectional slices of an anatomical region and a, rep a text report then written by a radiologist. By default, they're not really designed around the needs of patients. And, and we can understand that, you know, as, as a result, they're very different from other tests like blood test results, which have you know, well-defined kind of straightforward ranges. We also realized that getting radiology reporting right could have implications for topics like explainability as automated analysis of imaging becomes more common. And so interestingly, you know, by inviting patients and family members and clinical caregivers into this process of problem selection, we uncovered a computing challenge that's both important to patients, but also has wider implications uh, for the computing field. So entering phase three of this work, we homed in on the problem of helping families navigate these radiology reports. And we did three studies in this phase. So we conducted analyses of online health forum data to gauge patients' information needs related to imaging reports. And this was important because you know, we had some interview data, but this was a fairly, this was a smallish sample, right? So we wanted to see, are there also things that are, are kind of, are there transferable questions, right? Or, or, or even generalizable questions. And we looked at how people phrased questions online, asked questions, what are the stylistic considerations and how they explain things to one another. We ran some language modeling and text analytics on over 200,000 radiology reports and distilled phrases that provided a better understanding of the functions that different phrases serve in the report. And then we developed a web application with a touch-based user interface that was formatted for interaction on a large tablet and designed to handle a written um, CT or MRI report. And we ran a pilot study um, at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta to understand if this was, um, if our prototype was useful. We started with MRI and CT scans. And to build our corpus of questions, um, we scraped about 1600 posts using radiology specific keywords, ending up with about 480 question posts for analysis after excluding irrelevant content. 
we did some qualitative analysis using standard social media analysis techniques with human coders and found that posters had questions at several levels. So here are some of the top level information needs <clears throat> in descending order of frequency that we saw them. First, radiology report content itself, what do terms and sections mean? And then what could be known from the specific diagnostic test? You know, what does this general type of study show or, or not show? Where does it fit in with other testing in the broader healthcare process? And fourth, you know, what role does this test play for their particular illness, right? For their, their complaint and, and their personal experience. And we found that posters largely went online to seek interpretation of report content. And importantly, this wasn't just like looking up terms, you know, this was also, um, you know, we saw a high prevalence of questions regarding inferencing meaning from whole sections and phrases. And so this started to give us some insights into design goals for an application that could support patients in reading their reports. So in the next study, in this research phase, we mined and sampled common phrases from a corpus of over 200,000 radiology reports. We validated concepts and functions of the report through individual sessions with radiologists. And it was really important, you know, so, so we had information about, you know, what kinds of information um, people were looking for. Now we wanted to go to radiologists, right? And kind of include them in the process of figuring out what can we reliably do? Um, and let's take a quick look at why this was important, why we didn't just kind of start throwing, you know, language modeling at this right away. Um, so don't worry about technical terms. I'm, I'm gonna take us through a sample radiology report. Don't necessarily worry about, um, you know, what, what the conclusions are. Focus more on understanding general characteristics, right? Um, and key considerations for how we would process this. So let's look at this section called indication here at the top. In this section, we have a sentence about findings, but because it's under indication, we know it's talking about previous findings motivating the current study. The structure helps us in the disambiguation. So a naive algorithm just looking for a declarative statement with a term finding could, could actually get this wrong. And similarly, patients could be confused. Well, we also have varying resolution of temporal references. We wouldn't be able to plot, you know, if we wanted to, all of the events that are referred. And we wouldn't be able to necessarily find the intervals, temporal intervals, right, of, at, at which they're valid. So sometimes we have temporal information that's really specific. Like down here, we have a reference to yesterday at 5.30 p.m. But then we have terms like history of and calcification seen. And all we know is that these, these observations happened before the, this exam, right? That's, that's it's kind of all we know. Presence and absence of evidence has varying specificity and at times really ambiguous qualifiers. So we have to be careful about conclusions. So in the second paragraph, we see mild asymmetry of the kidneys. Well, how would we quantify that? Um, we see terms like, you know, moderate amount of fluid. Um, you know, really, it's really hard to translate that into a quantifiable representation. And so a lot of medical data lies in this, you know, kind of in-between state of qualitative and quantitative. And what mild could mean to one radiologist who's conservative might be very different, you know, for, for another radiologist. Then we see uncertainty expressed in particular ways. We see clinical correlation is recommended after mentioning the possibility of septic arthritis. So that means don't rely on this exam alone to make an arthritis diagnosis. Um, we see lots of references to body parts, but with varying precision. So sometimes it's the kidneys, sometimes it's left kidney, sometimes it's a specific region, left pelvis below the ischial spine. Um, and so, you know, these terms can help orient and localize the reader, but we could see how difficult it would be to account for the variance in precision. And finally, we see follow-up recommendations in the impression section here. Um, if there's another clinical study that's suspicious, then the radiologist recommends following up, like following up with an MRI. So these are just a few examples of considerations for modeling and navigating the reports. And I show this because we started out thinking, oh, this is a translation problem, right? 
um, patients and families want something that's more patient friendly. So why don't we support technical to lay language translation? But based on the radiologists and stakeholders participation in the process, we could actually see that this is misguided. And we landed on the goal of designing computing tools to support a discussion about the report rather than trying to produce a translation with varying uh, confidence. Um, okay, and because what we really, what we learned that we really wanted to do is support sense-making, right? Which happens through communication between the patient and the clinician. Um, so, you know, let's see here. Note too that we can already see functions that this report plays, right? Like localizing the observations in the report through references to uh, a body part or an organ and expressing certainty or uncertainty in very specific ways. So this helps the reader interpret the confidence level of the radiologist's recommendations and plays and so plays an important function there. So, so we wanted to distill a more complete set of phrases and their mappings to concepts and functions because these are candidates for us to design for in our patient facing application. So we worked with seven radiologists and asked them to review common phrases based on our extraction of these phrases from our report corpus to indicate matching concepts. And we paid attention to actions versus observations and, and learned different ways of describing these to get a set of concepts in the end that were consistent and that could inform our design process. So in other words, it wasn't necessarily, uh, we, we wanted to understand you know, what the content was, but also more importantly, the function, right? That it serves so that we could design for these specific functions. And at the end of these two studies, we found 13 concept categories that indicate these important functions of the report that can be supported through design. And I won't have time to go through uh, the whole process because I'm, I'm realizing, I'm, I'm trying to be mindful of time here, but we iterated on design ideas that embodied these concepts, like how do we better, better illustrate the size and the appearance of a nodule that might be found, right? Or how do we bring in graphical depictions when a reference to a body part or organ is mentioned? We selected a subset of concepts that our design could support, as shown here in gray to start with, and these inform the design of our prototype, uh, which we called Rapport. So <clears throat> next we developed a prototype, this Rapport prototype, and I'll show you our design goals alongside the prototype we built, but we used a suite of clinical text analysis tools to do some automated processing of an uploaded raw report in plain text. Um, we used heuristic approaches to map sen sentences um, and noun phrases recognized by this suite um, of processing tools and used API calls to libraries. Many uh, you know, available libraries are already provide patient-friendly explanations. Um, and we use um, biodigital human anatomy for um, rendering some visual data. And so these are rendered in our a web application UI. And you know, here we're moving along in our pipeline from having collected data and defining outcomes we care about which in this case is a better understanding of diagnostic data and support for clinical conversations to doing some algorithmic development and system building for this goal and writing a prototype for evaluation. So we wanted to stay in kind of wireframe format in the beginning. And so I'm showing you what patients saw. I mean, we've since iterated on this, um, but you know, it's important to kind of show you what patients saw. So, our first design goal was to structure an organized report content to simplify navigation. And we wanted to identify and restructure important subsections, like the impressions, which, which are the radiologist takeaways or conclusions. We wanted to bring really upfront um, only after follow-up, which would indicate you know, exactly what the patient needed to do so that that was really made prominent. And I'll show you a video of this in action. But a third goal was to clarify medical jargon within the clinical context, providing lay explanations, and then allowing users to note their questions and comments um, for their oncologists. So here, we enable the user to compare reports navigating to referenced exams from the current report to see the status and report summaries up front. And we identify medical concepts and important sections of interest to connect phrases and terms to auto-linked explanations that people can interact with further through these information cards. Um, and so since we knew to look for things um, like size 
and position text, we were also able to add um, reference measures. Here we're localizing where an observation uh, is referring to. And again, you know, looking at size and position of text, offering reference measures for sizing information. You know, five, mil five millimeters is hard to grasp unless you have a familiar object to refer to. And let's see here. Uh, system suggestions are shown when ambiguous phrases are found in the report. So in this way, we explore some principles from mixed initiative interaction <clears throat> to clarify what might be ambiguous to the reader. To support um, you know, the transparency of the entire report, we allow browsing and then questions in the context of reading. So the patient can select any portion of the report and, and browse the full report if they like, associating it with questions and discussion topics while maintaining the context of, of that portion. And then, you know, this is available in a My Notes tab. So each content fragment appears in a note card and then users can add questions, comments, um, and, and they all kind of appear in, in one place for them to reference. So we ran a pilot with patients, parents, and oncologists at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, and we acquired the most recent CT or MRI scan report. In most cases, the scan was conducted and the report was completed during the same patient visit and then promptly reviewed by the oncologist and then subsequently uploaded um, into our prototype. A researcher demonstrated the features by performing a guided tutorial using a sample radiology report first so that the patient had a, a better understanding of what this thing could do before deciding, yes, please load my report. Um, and then if they agreed, you know, we provided um, the prototype with their data loaded and we wanted them to interact with it unguided. We included a total of 28 patient and family member participants and five oncologists, and it was important to situate initial review within the clinical setting. What we found was that interaction with the report led to dynamic interspersing of report interaction and patient-led as well as clinician-led discussions. So we found that these discussions started out focusing on technical concepts, but then patients and parents were able to draw on their technical knowledge to ask about symptoms, disease processes, treatment. And this was really cool because you know, we found that when we put the teen in the driver's seat, right? typically we would give the teen the tablet um, and the rest of the care team, the parent, oncologists, et cetera, would then kind of gather around. So we really saw the patient you know, start to become um, you know, the, the centerpiece here and um, drive some of the communication that was happening by operating the technology. It was rarely the case that someone else in the family ended up doing that. It was typically the patient. So, you know, we observed oncologists sketching out relevant parts of the body uh, on a drawing board, using bed sheets to explain and have these kind of enriched discussions. And so it started out as a patient reviewing the report turned into these rich patient-driven conversations. And several patients and parents told us that they really liked being able to quickly retrieve explanations and diagrams, and, and they liked that they didn't need to filter the quality. Um, so, you know, we also heard things like notes are gonna help us keep track of follow-up instructions. And this is really important, right? Because this is where if, if there's a recommendation for follow-up that somehow uh, gets missed, right? This is where we can start to see poor outcomes as a result of not intervening when we need to. So, you know, essentially you know, we saw a new avenue for teenage patient engagement and improved communication in the clinic compared to what we had seen before. Uh, and we've since been refining the design and in ongoing work, we're developing text analytic capabilities to help browse these reports even further, right? Highlighting and ranking elements of previous reports that relate to a span of user selected text um, to, to show targeted comparisons, for example. So I'll quickly just touch on some of our more recent work uh, that builds on uh, findings from our first big qualitative study. And these, this has to do with enabling better understanding and communication about illness experiences and observations. So based on this finding, we added a parallel phase to our research. This was a new research project 
um, new funding, et cetera, started in parallel with the radiology work. And it has to do with the fact that, you know, access to clinical data is really only part of the story, right? So there's a lot of information generated about the patient in the clinical setting, but the reported experience really matters too. And patients with complex chronic conditions are also encouraged to track symptoms and side effects between visits. Well, clinical instruments used to capture self-report data don't match how patients think about their feelings and experiences. It's hard for them to recall what happened. And so we need to give them better ways of capturing what they want to say. And if you think about how teens communicate these days, it's very different from the types of uh, structured um, Q&A that happens in the clinic. So if we were to try to learn from this data in the record right now, we'd be missing a lot and we might even make you know, the wrong conclusions. Um, so how do we do a better job collecting patient reported data? You know, what observations matter to the patient? And how do we directly bring in their voice, right? And other important perspectives. And the other reason why this is important is not just about data quality, right? And, and engagement of the patient attending to, to the, this information, but you know, this information can help clinicians provide supportive care. So in the case of cancer patients, referrals to relevant nutritionists, psychological care, right, and, and more. So fortunately, researchers have created a framework for capturing what are called observations of daily living. And these represent things that matter to patients, but also have clinical relevance. So physical symptoms, mood, et cetera, describe what are called status indicators, activities, are behavioral indicators, and social and, and environmental contexts are exposures in this framework. So we wanted to define and elicit observations that matter from the patient's perspective, in this case, adolescent patients, through a process that's meaningful for them. And we made these design artifacts or graphical cards that depict these observations. We called these visual observations of daily living. We base these design artifacts on known measures in the medical literature and further expanded the list to include lifestyle related things like listening to music, et cetera. Um, and so you know, we created essentially a library of these and in co-design sessions, teens created storyboards using these cards, iterating on them, adding new illustrations um, to kind of add to this library. And they use this to create storyboards to depict uh, multiple aspects of the patient experience. We started our process in the clinic to capture representations that matter to them. Here's a close up of some of the cards we used and generated with patients in the family, top right, and a storyboard in progress, bottom left here. And we saw advantages for this co design approach. Uh, we were able to help scaffold storytelling effort, right? Uh, so we have to be careful about the burden of, of design activities with patient families. Um, but we were able to scaffold some of the effort through these visual artifacts and encourage recognition of what resonated with them versus demanding that they recall what matters. We also knew from prior research that teens can be in conflict with parental caregivers about how they assess what's going on and how they report their own illness experience, their power dynamics. Um, and so, you know, we also in the design process needed to provide different configurations of the design activity sometimes with parents, sometimes without, um, to provide privacy um, and neutralize power differences sometimes with other patients so that there were more patients than researchers in the room. And by doing this, one big finding is that using activities as anchors made it easier for teens with complex chronic conditions to express symptoms that were clinically relevant. So one of the patients told me that it's, it's difficult for her to be at school because while well, she feels really tired, she still has to climb stairs to move between classes. So when you asked her about her pain, she said, it's fine, it's okay. But when you asked her about what was it like to be at school today? Did you have to climb the stairs, right? And, and specific activities, that's where we learned a lot more about levels of fatigue, uh, pain, et cetera. And so this was really kind of an anchor that helped with elaboration even further. Another finding is that patients wanted to use a variety of media technology like videos, photos, and text to capture characteristic attributes of their experience. So we collected these preferences uh, as they were creating their storyboard. So we know now that we need to support both abstract and concrete representations um, to get at the full nuance of an experience. And finally, we learned that 
ob observations of illness experiences can be collaboratively documented. So there is a role for the parents here, um, but the parents should not be focusing on the felt experience, right? That's for the teen patient to, to report. And so we saw that teens tended to focus on these felt experiences and tended to be okay with family members attending to contextual details around symptoms and side effects. So, you know, we've moved out of the clinic, we've done more with this uh, using diary studies and diary probes uh, to help us validate our representations and their relevance to logging daily observations, understand privacy features. And with this and our insights from the co-design study, we're iteratively developing a mobile health application to collect illness experiences and symptoms when it becomes clinically important to do so. So I wanna be mindful of time. Um, might save that video for another time. But basically, so uh, here we are at the end. We started with an overarching question about how we can enable participatory approaches across phases of model building and system development. We looked at some examples of projects that use human-centered and participatory design now, where can we apply some of these approaches going forward to ensure that advancements are human-centered? And I think one area here is consent and the, the locus of control in the decision action cycle in human AI interaction. How much should be done on a caregiver's behalf? What does assistance mean in terms of what they want um, to consent to receiving help with? Um, and I think this will be, I think we'll see really interesting questions uh, arise that we'll need to have multi-stakeholder involvement in solving. Like, could an AI be my agent with power of attorney in some situations? So also consent models for ongoing data collection and use in health contexts. We're also seeing AI start to enter the care team. So, you know, right now though, there's a legal framework for professional advice giving that governs you know, the patient clinician decision-making that happens. And so how do we, you know, foreground things like patient autonomy and inform decision-making for the patient when we have knowledge asymmetries between what an AI system might know, what a clinician might know, and what a patient might know? And how do we introduce AI assistance into care? What, how do we better understand these mental models, right? Like the nurse had a mental model from the first study, the Thailand study, nurses had a mental model that this thing could potentially help train them. Um, but, you know, again, we see differences. And so we've actually seen, I won't have time to touch on this, but fully today, right? But we've conducted studies with pathologists interacting for the first time with AI assistance. And we found that beyond understanding local case specific reasoning for a model decision, these clinicians wanted upfront information about basic global properties of the model, like it's known capabilities or strengths and, weak, and, and weaknesses or limitations, its point of view, is it more conservative? Is, it, does, is, is the design objective to help compensate for human bias or to perform you know, um, uh, consistently overall? And so we have a case study that will be published at CHI this year describing how the process of developing onboarding materials change in engineering teams understanding of end user requirements um, and led to some fundamental modifications in the development and assessment of the underlying machine learning model. So that's coming up here. Um, and we'll also have a workshop coming up at CHI that uh, has led to a special issue of TOKAI. And so keep an eye out for that. We have some great editors uh, for that work. And finally, a paper on the caregiver experience that goes in depth on caregivers in the US and their experiences coordinating care, which has a lot of implications for where computational assistance, how we can think about intervening, like what are the right tasks? Uh, what are the right um, design considerations uh, and implications given these caregivers coordination challenges? How should we think about intervening? Thank you so much for your time and attention. I wanna uh, just acknowledge my collaborators and funders. And hopefully I've still left a few minutes for questions. <laughs> Thank you. That was a very inter interesting talk. And I invite everyone to share your applause either on screen or through reactions. I think we have time for two questions. And the first question is from Melin. Melin, do you want to ask the question directly? Mm -hmm. 
So Lauren, uh, thank you uh, for an excellent presentation. And I, um, I'm just reading the question I wrote down. I wholeheartedly agree with the participatory approach. We need more of it uh, in AI for social impact. But in order for AI conferences to advocate for this approach or to, you know, for AI researchers to actually embrace this approach, we need the AI evalu conference evaluation criteria, papers and so forth to actually value that because if the reward system is not set up, people will not write papers like that, that would just not be valued. And so the question becomes, um, you know, how do we actually do that in terms of getting more of what you talked about as evaluation criteria within AI conferences that want to have more of this AI for social impact work. And are you aware of maybe workshops that have started to do this at the intersection of HCI and AI? Is it valuable to have a some kind of a workshop in this sphere? Your thoughts on that? Yeah, I have seen workshops start to arise. So I think this has been more, so I think this idea is taking hold in the fairness community because we realize that that you know, fairness is a sufficiently complex topic, but that how we approach a problem, um, if if we are approaching a problem purely from the computing research perspective, there are you know fundamental questions of is that fair, right? If if we're creating technology, um, and we're we're kind of seeing our expertise as being, um, if we're leading with our expertise, right, versus seeing our expertise as just as important as uh, community knowledge, right? And, and community expertise, you know, what does that say about the impact on that community, right? And, and, and whether or not we're solving the right problem to begin with. So I think, you know, it, it's, I, I think the answer to your question, you know, is, is a difficult one because we've also seen that we have, you know, areas of work develop in human computer interaction and design that seem to kind of be in silos, right? And they're not necessarily taking hold either in the machine learning community, or we're, we're seeing some reinvention where machine learning starts to, methodological machine learning research starts to present itself in you know, human uh, computing interaction conferences. Meanwhile, HCI starts to be reinvented in machine learning. So you know, I, I don't necessarily know the answer, but I think continuing to have these talk series, you know, like you do here, right? Just exposing people to these ideas, um, starting tracks within conferences. I know there have also been workshops that have started to, to take hold around community-based participation. Um, and things like, you know, the new guidelines that I, that I pointed to, I think will also move the needle here because what we will need to, in order to complete a satisfiable, clinical trial, a randomized controlled trial, we will need to be able to report on, you know, how this technology was used, which will, you know, uh, necessitates the need for human centered research, right? And what the human AI interaction looks like. So if you want FDA approval, you need to do these trials. And if you want to do them, you know, in keeping with standards. So, so I think part of, part of that we'll see start to happen just as a result of these new guidelines and standards that are that are emerging? That's an excellent question. I think there's a lot more to explore there. Great, thank you. And um, last question is from Fred Riss. Uh, Fred, do you, do you wanna answer a question and maybe introduce yourself a little bit? Um, can you unmute? There we go. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm Fred Riss. I've come to a number of these things over the years. Um, I'm a graduate of the college in 1968 before computer science was available to uh, undergraduates. Uh, but that's basically what I've been doing. Sorry about that. So um, I'm, I'm wondering, well, first of all, comment. Your second to last slide with questions um, around permissions agency, so on and so forth. That that would be worth an entire hour of discussion uh, <laughs> by itself, uh, but you've given a lot of ammunition towards it here. So what, what I was cogitating about um, is sort of a prosaic spinoff. 
you've taken um, a number of patients and caregivers and providers and gone through a, a knowledge transfer exercise. Um, if you do this enough times, um, is it possible that that could lead to building a simulation of a patient to do the same thing and then hit a lot of radiology reports from the same radiologist, which collectively could provide constructive feedback to the radiologist about how he or she writes reports? Um, and even if you could, would they accept that? Yeah, those are some, some really excellent questions. So I think, let me start with your last question um, about kind of radiologists accepting feedback. Um, I, think, I think it's a really good one. And, and generally, you know, the, generally there's a referring physician, like a referring oncologist who orders the test and the communication to make the most sense of it happens between that referring physician and the radiologist. And so I think, I think there's, you know, I don't know that we would see uh, radiologists changing necessarily the way that they, that they uh, read a scan and, and comment on it. I do though think that there's opportunity for clarification uh, at, which already happens now. So there's already kind of this clarification that happens between the referring physician and the radiologist. And I think we could explore that as an opportunity for um, explanatory content that could also help the patient. So in other words, you know, if patients did have more uh, resources and tools to be able to explore these radiology reports, you know, I, I do see opportunity for flagging certain things that would then be part of uh, a conversation with the referring physician as well. So, but, but you know, it's, it's, it's kind of standard ways of writing things. And so it really, and, and, and not to say that that's consistent necessarily, right, across all radiologists, but I, so I think there's, I think there's a mix, right? I think there's a, some opportunity for, for feedback, right? And, and we could certainly even analyze some of those conversations, like, what are, you know, are referring physicians asking the same kinds of questions? Like, hey, what do you mean, you know, by mild asymmetry? Like, what's my, what, what do you think mild means, right? So I think we could probably try to do more to under, to distill, you know, what kinds of questions come up so that we can do, have some uh, feedback that could influence precision in writing. Um, but I also think that some of the ambiguity is always going to be there and it's there for a purpose and it's, you know, part of it is a legal purpose, but helping patients understand that this doesn't mean that there won't be an answer, right? Uncertainty is resolved in this context through communication. So it's really about then supporting like, okay, this means we need to do another test, right? Like that's so much, just even knowing that like clinical correlation is needed. Okay, we're gonna do a, We're gonna do a CT scan in three months, right? Like knowing that, okay, this is, this is the, um, what the meaning of this uncertainty is really that more evidence is required and we have a plan for that, it's much more satisfying than just seeing a phrase that's somewhat ambiguous and, and has a bit of uncertainty. So, so I think that there's also a lot we could do with just even understanding, again, like how do we bring in some of these tools to elaborate and provide better explanations based on the common uses of these phrases. As far as the, as far as the, um, like simulating the patient experience, I think that's really interesting. This is, this is difficult because we have varying levels of health literacy. Some, some patients are experts, you know, some patients are experts both on, on their, their body's responses to things, but also aspects of the medical system and the data that they're getting. And, and some aren't in, in terms of being able to re-diagnostic data and understand it. So I think it'll, I think there's a whole rich discussion to have around how you would simulate, you know, the, the patient as an agent, you know, that would potentially be reading something and scoring it. Um, I think it's a, a, an amazing idea, um, but it, it is one that I think there's some fairly nuanced differences that would be worth dis discussing. So that circles back to your very first slide. If we didn't have 
uh, electronic health records, we would have nothing to talk about here. <laughs> True. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for the question. And thank you, Lauren, for sharing your research for it with us. Um, if we have any more questions, what is the best way to reach out to you? Yeah, so it, please reach out. Uh, I'm on Twitter. That's probably the easiest to stay right. LGW underscore. Um, so you can reach out to me there. I think I have that contact info. Um, yeah. Awesome. All right. Thank, thanks thank for you. thanks for your attention. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing and. Um, yeah, that concludes the seminar today, and please share your applause with us for Lauren, who's very kind to talk about her research here today. Thank you, everyone.